Hi everyone, um, welcome to the last lecture video uh, for the semester. Um, I'm going to be talking today about remote sensing, which is I know a topic that a lot of people are interested in. Um, and so fortunately, the computer vision methods that we learned earlier in the course uh, transfer really well to remote sensing. Um, and so in this lecture, we'll actually spend a fair bit of time discussing important features of remote sensing data. Um, because in many ways, like if you want to do something with remote sensing, there's just a vast heterogeneity of different data that comes from satellites, and it's important to understand what's available and what are the limitations of different types of data that are available. Um, and then we'll discuss some state-of-the-art architectures um, as well as pre-training for remote sensing, um, and I really look forward to discussing applications uh, more in class. All right, so this is the first satellite image. This was taken in 1946. Um, and so as you'll see in a minute, satellite data has come a long way since this time. Okay, um, and so generally speaking with modern satellites, there's three different types of remote sensing data. There's very high resolution imagery. Um, these are visible images. Um, so they're taken from the visible spectrum. Um, and they have high spatial resolution. Um, and so what high spatial resolution means may differ from context to context, um, but you know, for example, they might be um, greater than two meters resolution. Um, there's a hyperspectral imagery. Um, this has information from across the electromagnetic spectrum, often not visible to the human eye. Um, and so this is useful for weather applications. It's, it's, it's very useful for uh, lots of um, uh, science applications, um, seen it a bit less in economics, kind of for other applications, um, but we'll talk about it as well. Um, and then there's synthetic aperture radar imagery, which, you know, the first two types uh, that I've listed here, um, the satellite receives information. It's looking at energy kind of that gets reflected off the Earth back into space to the satellite. The satellite is not creating the energy itself. It's just um, taking in this optical information, um, whereas with synthetic aperture radar, um, the satellite itself um, sends a signal and then that signal is received back and it uses that information to create two-dimensional images or three-dimensional objects such as landscapes. Okay. Um, and so the first thing that you need to understand um, if you're going out and looking for satellite data to use is that satellites have different orbital paths. Um, and so there's a low Earth orbit, which is the innermost circle there that's um, kind of very close to the Earth, a mid-Earth orbit, um, and a high Earth orbit, which is about one-tenth of the distance to the moon. And these satellites at different orbits um, will collect very different types of information. Um, and um, so the closer a satellite is to the Earth, the faster it will move, and also it has a smaller orbit to go around. And so low Earth uh, satellites um, orbit the Earth many times in a given day, um, whereas geostationary satellites, which are in high orbit, um, will um, be geostationary over a given point on the Earth because they're moving around the Earth at the same speed that the Earth is rotating. Um, in the middle, you have these um, uh, mid-range altitude satellites. They're often used for communication, GPS type purposes. And their orbit um, is such um, that they see uh, every point on the Earth two times a day. All right. Um, and so um, orbits also have an eccentricity, um, which is important for some applications. Um, and they have an inclination. Um, and um, so they could be, um, they could have a polar um, inclination where they're uh, rotating around the Earth over its poles. Um, this is, you see here, um, a tilted um, inclination. And so the inclination of the satellite is obviously going to affect what it sees as well. Um, and so first, let me say a word about high Earth orbit. Um, and so at a given distance from the center of the Earth, which is around 42,000 kilometers, the orbit matches the Earth's rotation. Um, and it could move back and forth uh, between latitudes. But if the orbit is directly over the equator, um, 
it will always be directly over the same place on Earth. Um, and so they launch it to just the right point where as it rotates uh, around the Earth, um, as the Earth turns, it's staying over the same point. And this is used, for example, for weather satellites. Um, because if you are monitoring the weather, you don't want to only like pass over a given point like two times a day or something like that's not um, useful. And so many weather satellites are in high Earth orbit, for instance. Um, there's also five Lagrange points where the pull of gravity from the Earth equals the pull of gravity from the Sun. And anything placed in these points will revolve with the Earth around the Sun. Uh, two of these points are stable. And so you see the Lagrange points here. This is like not so relevant for um, economic applications, but I just found it really interesting. Um, and um, so that L3 point, um, don't put anything there because it's directly opposite the sun from the Earth and it wouldn't be able to communicate with Earth. Um, but there are um, important... Um, uh, uh, satellites or observation uh, satellites at the L1 and L2 points. So L1 observes the sun and L2 is like the space telescopes. I think like the Hubble t space telescope was at L2 because the earth is always between it and the sun. And so it has a good vantage point um, to view the rest of the universe. Um, so again, not so useful for economic applications, but I never knew this and I thought it was kind of interesting. Okay. Uh, medium Earth orbit. Again, this is, I think, not so relevant for our applications, but I'll mention it because you see it in presentations of satellite data. Um, and so it rotates around the Earth in 12 hours um, uh, and sees each spot on Earth two times daily. Um, and um, so there's another example for medium Earth orbit um, beyond the semi-synchronous. So we saw with geostationary orbit that to be geostationary, it needs to be parked on the equator. Um, and this is um, not great for communications um, it, towards the poles. And so there's another eccentric orbit developed by the Soviet Union um, that because it's very eccentric, it spends much more time over one hemisphere than over the other. And that's useful for communication at the poles. Again, not so relevant to economics, but kind of interesting. Low Earth orbit. Uh, most scientific satellites and many weather satellites follow a low, low orbit uh, that has a nearly circular trajectory. Um, and the inclination of that orbit determines what the satellite is going to be able to observe. Um, and so this is the tropical rainfall measuring mission, which if you all work with weather data, you might have used these data. Um, and it has a low orbital inclination, just 35 degrees from the equator, and that allows its instruments to concentrate on the tropics. And so um, this is not going to give you uh, data about uh, weather at the poles. Um, all right. And so this image shows one half of the observations that it makes in a given day. Um, there's also polar orbiting satellites. So many satellites in NASA's Earth observing system have this orbit. They take about 99 minutes to circle the Earth and they'll see each point on Earth twice, once during the day and once at night. And again, they find this sweet spot, which is called the sun synchronous orbit, that means a location is observed at the same local time always. And so the angle of the sun will still change with the seasons, but this is really useful for doing various scientific measurements because if you see kind of the same point at the same time every day, that gets rid of other confounders that result from, you know, the sun being at very different angles, even in a given season. All right, um, and so those are the orbits. Um, and as I said, kind of very different orbits are going to give you different data. Um, satellites also have various types of resolution. So radiometric resolution, spatial resolution, spectral resolution, and temporal resolution. Um, and so the radiometric resolution refers to um, how many uh, bytes there are in the image. Um, and so you can see on the left, um, that that image only has four possible values that it can store for each pixel, um, whereas on the right, it can store up to 256 values. And this is gonna make a big difference to being able to see kind of um, finer details. Um, 
And you know, by the way, this is true with documents too. If you set your scanner settings to binary, most of the illegible documents we've had to deal with, many of them are binary scans. And so if you can just get more pixel values, you're gonna preserve much more information. Um, and one of the kind of most important advances in uh, satellite imagery um, in, in recent years have been increases in the radiometric resolution. It makes the instruments, you know, they're much more sensitive to small differences in electromagnetic energy, and thus they can capture sort of these very fine-grained differences. Spatial resolution, I think everybody should understand what this is, and it's clear to see the difference from the left to the right. Um, spectral resolution. Uh, so that determines how much a researcher can distinguish between different types of materials. Um, and so any material like present on Earth has its own unique spectral fingerprint. It reflects light in a particular way. Um, and oftentimes its spectral signature is not just, you know, dependent on the visible part of the spectrum, uh, but also on the infrared and ultraviolet parts of the spectrum. Um, and so the narrower the range of wavelengths for a given band, the finer the spectral resolution of the satellite. And so this is an image here for the airborne visible infrared imaging spectrometer, or um, Avaris, um, which captures information in 224 spectral channels. And this is a false color image um, showing the information that it captures in the visible and infrared portion of the spectrum. Oftentimes, valuable information falls outside of the visible spectrum. And so this is an image of a volcanic eruption in Iceland and the true color kind of visible part um, of uh, the image is shown on the left. And then on the right, you have this false color version that I believe is from the infrared uh, portion of the spectrum. And you can see there's just a lot more information available. Um, you know, my kids, like, they love to see... Um, like images from space of, you know, planets and whatnot. And oftentimes those are false color images um, because we can learn a lot about, say, the geochemical uh, makeup of a planet um, by using other parts of the spectrum as well. I oftentimes wonder if they would be so interested in these space images if they weren't all these kind of bright, beautifully colored um, fa false, Im false color images that show kind of representations of uh, reflections in other part of the spectrum. Uh, temporal resolution. So this is going to depend on the orbital path, the sensor's characteristics, and the swath width. And so this image is showing the temporal resolution of um, uh, MODIS in blue versus um, OLI aboard Landsat 8. Um, and so these are both, you know, probably examples of satellites that you've seen. Um, if, if you've worked with satellite data before, and so MODIS has this much wider uh, imaging swath, so it provides global coverage every one to two days versus 16 days um, for the OLI aboard Landsat. Um, and so you might ask, well, why don't we just have a satellite that has high resolution in every dimension? And of course, the answer is that there's inherent trade-offs. Um, and so, for example, increasing the spatial resolution requires a narrower swath because you have to be closer to the Earth, right? So you're closer up, you have higher spatial resolution, but you can't see as much um, in terms of the swath. And so that means there is more time between when an area is observed um, and hence lower temporal resolution. Um, another example, weather requires a high temporal resolution, but if you were studying seasonal vegetation changes, you might not need that high temporal resolution, um, and you might sacrifice that to get increased spectral or spatial resolution. And so there's these inherent trade-offs, um, and you know, with the general purpose satellite data that you get from NASA, I mean, it's trying to provide like a general purpose product, and so oftentimes it's not particularly good for observing something very specific. Um, in, in our reading group last semester, we had a student who, uh, an undergrad who student who was involved in the Harvard Satellite Club, and it was kind of just phenomenal. He'd been involved in building a satellite, um, and they got SpaceX to launch it, and then were monitoring, I believe, climate change in the Amazon from this CubeSat that they built um, and, and launched. And it's just kind of remarkable. And we had an entire conversation about how 
um, you know, based on these trade-offs, you could get so much better data about this specific thing that you want to study than you could get with the NASA data. Of course, you know, launching a satellite, building and launching a satellite is probably beyond most, but beyond what most of us would be able to do for an economics paper. Um, but, you know, just throwing that idea out there. <laughs> the students in my reading group were very intrigued to think about whether we had a research question that would necessitate us to um, try to find money to launch a satellite. I don't think we came up with one, um, but it's an interesting question. Okay, um, so I wanted to briefly mention synthetic aperture radar or SAR imagery. Um, and so using optical information for remote sensing does well if it's cloudless, if it's well illuminated, but it can make it difficult to collect data at night uh, during storms and in densely forested areas. Um, and so in synthetic aperture radar, a sensor produces energy and records the amount that was reflected back after interacting with the earth. And so this is an example of, I think, like oil storage barrels um, uh, from a SAR image. And you can see it's like pretty um, fine grained what you can observe with it. Okay, um, so the final thing I want to mention when we talk about satellite data is oftentimes as economists, we want to measure things over time and we want to go, you know, potentially quite far back in time. And satellite technology has just improved drastically over the past several decades. Um, and Older satellites, they had much worse resolutions, um, sort of in the various dimensions, um, and they might have been processed into something um, that provided a much noisier signal of what you would like to observe. You know, so I think in some of the um, historical satellite weather data, the resolution is effectively something on the order of 200 kilometers. So it's just very, very coarse um, what some of the older satellites can provide. Um, and so please just take that into account. If you're using historical satellite data, you really should understand what satellite collected it and what were the capabilities of that satellite and don't overstate what you're able to observe um, given the technology on board that satellite. Um, so I think you, you, you really don't wanna fall into that trap of saying like, oh, I use the satellite data going back in time and I'm gonna use it on like a one kilometer grid or something that's just you know far beyond what it would have been capable of observing. All right, um, and so that's an overview of satellite data. Um, and now we'll talk a little bit about processing satellite data. Um, and so this is, figure is drawn from a review article on the transformer for remote sensing, uh, which I believe was on the reading list. Um, and you can see there's different types of tasks for very high resolution imagery, hyperspectral imagery, um, and, and um, SAR imagery. Um, and so classification is prominent there, but you can see object detection, uh, change detection, segmentation, etc. So I think that this, and the, the review article is kind of a helpful overview as well. And this gives us a sense, and you can see a lot of these tasks are things that we already learned about with documents or natural images, but things are a little bit different, right? Because our input data is just quite different. Um, and so transformers have made significant inroads. Um, and um, so um, a VIT is a state of the art um, for various tasks. Um, SWEN in particular, um, has been very popular um, recently in remote sensing. Um, the shifting window architecture is useful for dealing with high resolution images, right? So a very important difference potentially between ImageNet versus satellite imagery is ImageNet, it's like one central object and you can get by with having pretty low resolution. So a 16 by 16 patch size is, is fine. Um, but satellite images, much like kind of documents or even more so, um, you can need very, very high resolution images because there's a lot of objects, there's a lot of detail that you wanna capture within that image. Um, and the SWIN can be well suited to that. Um, hybrid architectures are also quite popular. Um, so you see an example here um, where you essentially are passing the image both into a VIT and into a CNN, and the VIT is giving you this global cross attention whereas the CNN is giving you the inductive biases from a CNN that you get from having the sliding window, and then they have kind of a method to combine those and do classification. All right, um, 
I've also seen kind of other use of, of hybrid models that seems to be fairly popular in the remote sensing literature. So there's an example here, and um, this is using SWIN, um, and um, it's taking in, um, so it's using SWIN, and it's using it for just image classification again, and it's taking in the original image, and then it's taking in an edge image extracted from the original image. Um, and you know, to be honest, like, you might think like, why, why would you need to do this? Couldn't part of what the neural architecture is learning is just, it learns to attend to the edges. And I think that is true. I have a feeling like why that this is helpful is that somehow there's like really limited labeled data and maybe there's just not enough data for it to quite learn um, to attend to those edges. Um, but in any case, um, so it's fairly intuitive what they're doing. They have these two different representations of the image. They pass it in and use a fusion model uh, akin to what we've seen earlier in the course as well to fuse those um, and then do image classification. Um, change detection. So I thought that this architecture is really nice and is really intuitive compared to what we've seen earlier in the class. And so they essentially have um, a bioencoder that is a hierarchical transformer. And so they pass the pre-period image into one of the uh, bioencoders and the post-period image into the other to encode them. And then they use a lightweight MLP decoder to generate the binary change map. And this is oftentimes, you know, if you're studying land cover or whatever, it's oftentimes of interest to detect the changes between two images. And I think this is a fairly intuitive way to do that. All right. And so, you know, there's lots of other applications of processing satellite data, but I'd say kind of the general state of the literature is state of the art seems to mostly be transformers, SWIN particularly, but it's still quite common to use the hybrid architectures like the one I show you that kind of combine transformers and CNNs. Um, and other types of hybrid models as well seem kind of more common in this literature than I've seen elsewhere, but the intuition is similar. These are just SWIN. Uh, transformer models um, and then they're fused together um, and the change detection does it in a very t intuitive way pass the before and after image into a bioencoder and then use an MLP decoder to generate the change map all right um, so yeah there, there's there's other stuff but I think a lot of it is kind of in these lines like use SWIN or use a hybrid model, um, and oftentimes they're doing classification or some type of change detection. You know, when you see remote sensing used um, in, say, the social science literature or even in other literatures, um, you'll still see lots of CNNs, and I think maybe in part that's because, you know, as we saw with documents too, it's not clear that the returns are huge from the transformer, and also just the transformer is so recent and we have pretty long publication lags, and so, um, even if people are ultimately going to settle on all using SWIN, it takes time for stuff to come through the pipeline. All right, I'm going to say a word about pre-training for remote sensing. And so ImageNet looks nothing like remote sensing images. So does this mean we need to start from a different backbone? Um, and there's a 2022 paper um, that explores this issue in this literature. Um, it's going to seem super reminiscent of what we talked about when we were talking about... Um, you know, NLP, and if we are interested in Shakespeare and 17th century stuff, do we want to use Roberta, or do is that just, it's too different, and we want to um, pre-train a model just on the 17th century stuff? We talked about this with audio, where the answer was the state of the art was actually pre-trained on ImageNet, um, and we're going to see a similar theme kind of emerge here. Um, and so this paper pre-trains from scratch on a data set called um, million AID, which contains around a million non-overlapping scenes grouped into different classes. And then they further tune on downstream data sets for remote sensing, and they compare to ImageNet pre-training. And what they find is that on some tasks, they do kind of very marginally better than ImageNet pre-training. And on others, when T pre-trained on ImageNet actually does kind of marginally better. And so the takeaway is that ImageNet pre-training is competitive, um, you know, spend a lot of resources to pre-train uh, from scratch on this million image data set of remote sensing images, and it doesn't really matter. You can just pre-train on ImageNet and then fine-tune, and the results are actually pretty similar because 
mostly what you're getting. I think the takeaway is mostly what you're getting from the ImageNet pre-training is a very general understanding of images and objects that actually extends well um, to this remote sensing domain. I mean, I think this might have been on only uh, images with the visible spectrum, so maybe things are different if you're working across the broad spectrum. I could be wrong about that, but I think this was just visible spectrum, and that's why they chose this data set. Um, but in any case, um, the bottom line is that ImageNet pre-training does pretty well. Um, there's another paper called Consecutive Pre-Training CSPT. I think it's also a 2022 paper, and it applies the idea that we saw in NLP of don't stop pre-training to remote sensing. Um, so they start with ImageNet and then they keep pre-training on remote sensing data um, and they find that this can outperform training on remote sensing data alone um, or on ImageNet alone at a much lower cost. And so this is very reminiscent of the discussion again that we had in the NLP space where maybe some people found it was marginally better to just pre-train on you know, the 17th century English or whatever, but then other people found it was um, you know, the, the, the don't stop pre-training paradigm actually outperformed, um, you know, pre-training from scratch and in any case is also um, much cheaper. Um, and so the paradigm is you pre-train on ImageNet, etc. Um, you know, in reality, you're going to go download that backbone because other people have done that. And then you keep using the same approach. So in this paper, it's a masked autoencoder to pre-train on unlabeled remote sensing data. And the fact that they're using May here um, is important. You could also imagine using something like Dino maybe. Um, and that way they you know, are not limited by the fact that there are not many labeled um, images in remote sensing. Um, and I'm not sure how representative those are, but if you're using self-supervised uh, approach, um, then you can just keep pre-training on unlabeled data just like we would do for NLP. And then finally, um, fine tune on the task specific data set. Um, and they find that this self-supervised pre-training can save a lot of annotation costs. Um, and so this is, um, you know, their framework. So they, there's this, um, you know, image net pre-training, um, and then they're going to do further self-supervised pre-training with May, um, on, um, different types of, um, data. So both the stuff in the RGB spectrum and the stuff kind of in the broader spectrum, um, and, uh, the SAR data. Um, and so because um, it's self-supervised, they don't need label data sets for all of these things and they can just keep doing pre-training. And then they're going to fine tune um, for things like classification of scenes and land cover and object detection. Um, and the cool thing is they look at the attention maps and they compare them to, I know this figure is a little small, but they compare the attention maps to what they look like with just the ImageNet pre-training or just the supervised pre-training on remote sensing classification data. And they find that the self-attention maps look much better. Again, they're using this for um, classification. And like when they do that, they're focused on the uh, parts of the image that are relevant um, for the task. And so I think it's kind of cool that you can pursue these different approaches and look at the self-attention maps and show that it looks, you know, it gives us a way to understand why this approach of, you know, essentially don't stop pre-training is um, how it's doing better. Okay, I just have a couple of final fun notes about applications and then we'll talk a lot more about applications in class. This is courtesy of Xiao Yu who sent these to me um, and also sent me a lot of other super helpful resources about remote sensing. Um, but we were at a talk and the issue of remote sensing in archaeology came up um, and he sent me a couple of fun papers. So this one is using CNNs to classify Mayan archaeological sites. Um, and this one first uses GANs to generate synthetic noise data for pre-training to find shipwrecks because I guess the data is like very noisy and we don't have many of it and then they apply YOLO or faster or CNN um, and so you can see that with their kind of um, uh, synthetic data they're able to improve on uh, image quality and then are able to detect shipwrecks um, and so again I'll defer to Xiao Yu as an expert on <laughs> using remote sensing to find shipwrecks um, but indeed there's lots of um, lots of fun applications like this, and I hope that everybody will come to class um, with applications that they're interested in as well, so we can discuss forward, um, so we can discuss those further in class. Um, so thanks so much, and um, I really look forward to seeing everybody then.